I've scrapped the introduction. I hope I can live up to it. And I hope I can live up to the expectations that all of you have brought here. The late clergy committee has worked so hard for so many weeks to drum up excitement about my appearances, studying my books, reviewing my videotapes, that uh, I've been looking forward to this. Some of you are saying to me, <coughs> realizing that this is my fifth talk in about 32 hours, how I managed to do it. And I said, when it works, I draw strength from the audience. When people are really tuned in, not only am I sharing with you, but you're sharing with me. When you listen attentively, when you respond, there is an interchange of energy that goes on. That's what keeps me going. The fun I've had with my new book, How Good Do We Have to Be, was in the year before it was published. People would say to me, what are you working on? Do you have a new book coming out? And I would say, I'm writing a book about guilt. And the funny thing was, listening to Protestants, Catholics, and Jews compete as to whose religious education was more guilt producing. <laughs> describes herself as a recovering Catholic. <laughs> Who said to me, Harold, what do you know about guilt? You're Jewish. <laughs> we were taught in parochial school that bad weather was punishment for our misbehavior. <laughs> the bottom line, I guess, is that any religion makes people feel inadequate and guilty if you do it wrong. And any religion makes people feel good and strong and clean if you do it right. And I'm not here to advocate any particular religious view. I'm here to share with you my very strong conviction that your faith, in whatever brand name it comes packaged, needs to speak to you in two voices. One is the prophetic voice summoning you to do more, to reach higher, to be better, to be fairer, more kind, more just, more generous. And the other, the compassionate, forgiving voice, saying to you, when you have accepted those standards and fallen short of them, and you feel like a failure because you could not live up to what you believe, God still loves you. You are still acceptable in the sight of God. My book was born out of the intersection of two stories. One of them, thousands of years old, and you all know it, and the other one, a true story that happened to me about 10 years ago. <clears throat> the story you all know is the third chapter of the book of Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. For as long as I have known that story, since I was a child, and I'd be interested in you had the, if you had the same reaction when you first heard it as children. For as long as I have known that story, it has bothered me. There are loose ends in the story of the Garden of Eden. There are pieces that don't fit together. For one thing, it sounds like a setup. <laughs> Doesn't it? I mean, any time you have a story that says, don't eat the fruit, don't open the box, don't go in the room, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> Otherwise, there'd be no story. I can never understand if God didn't want them to eat the fruit, so don't make the fruit. <laughs> I mean, he's God. <laughs> More than that, once they have violated his rule and eaten the fruit, that God comes down so hard on Adam and Eve, the punishment seems so disproportionate to the crime. I walked away saying, boy, if God was going to do that to Adam and Eve for doing one thing wrong, what's he going to do to me for all the things I've done wrong? But more than anything else, it was the name of the fruit that puzzled me. It's not just the fruit you're not supposed to eat, the forbidden fruit. Do you remember the full name? It is the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I'm sorry, if you have an ingredient in the story that is called the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, that's got to be what the story is about. The story has to be about acquiring...
if I were wiser, if I were more learned, the story would make sense. But no matter how much older and more learned I became, I don't know about wiser, the story still didn't make sense. So I would just put it aside and not worry about it. And then about 10 years ago, something happened. I was invited to speak at the Johns Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland. I was asked to give two talks. A talk to the professional staff, the doctors, nurses, the social workers at noon, and then in the evening they were going to have a memorial lecture for all the children who had died on the pediatric oncology board, bringing their families and the nursing staff together in memorial. I finished my talk to the professionals at noon. The chaplain at Johns Hopkins Medical Center came over to me. He said, Rabbi Kushner, would you have 15 minutes to talk to one of our patients? We've got somebody in the hospital who would love to meet you. He's read all your books. They've been very important to him. He would love to have you come in and just chat with him for a few minutes. Now, I want to make this clear, the chaplain said to me. If you'd rather not, you certainly are under no obligation to. I'll tell him you were very busy, you were tired, you had a very crowded schedule. He's a 32-year-old Episcopal minister, and he's dying of AIDS. I said, sure, I'll go talk to him. I followed the chaplain down the corridor, feeling terribly noble and virtuous that I'm doing this. You know, I am the Jewish mother Teresa. <laughs> I go into this room, I see this frail figure lying in bed, hooked up in tubes. I say to him, hi, how are you doing? He says, not too good, but I'm getting used to it. I introduce myself, we chat for a while, he tells me some nice things about my books. And then I ask him, because I know this is an issue for a lot of religious people who come down with AIDS. I say to him, does it ever worry you that this is happening to you as a punishment for something you did? That God is striking you with this disease and that you're dying without God? They said, no, just the opposite. He said, the only good thing that has come out of this is that I have found out something I always wanted to believe was true really is true. No matter how much you've messed up your life, you have not forfeited God's love. He said to me, when I was a child, I thought I had to be perfect for people to love me. I tried so hard to be perfect so that everybody would love me. And every time I did something wrong, and every time I told a lie to cover up for what I did wrong, I was sure God was as contemptuous of me as I was of myself. And if other people found out what I was really like, they wouldn't like me either. But he said, lying here in the hospital with an incurable disease, I have found God's love in this hospital room. I have felt God's love in the doctors and nurses who know what I have, and they don't hesitate to try and make me feel better. I have found it in the friends and relatives who know that I have AIDS, and they come and sit and hold my hand and pray with me. And even at night when everybody goes home and they turn the lights off, I have felt God's loving presence in this hospital room. He said, I'm going to be leaving the hospital next week, not because I'm getting better, but because there's nothing more they can do for me and they need the bed. I don't know if my congregation will take me back. Now that they found out I'm gay and I have AIDS and I'm dying, I hope they will, because I have this one last sermon I need to preach to them. I need to tell them what this experience has taught me, that no matter how many things you've done wrong in your life, you have not alienated yourself from the love of God. I don't know if he ever got to give that sermon. I read that he died four months later. But that conversation has remained with me ever since. And one sentence that he said to me crystallized for me what bothered me about the Garden of Eden story. When he said, I thought I had to be perfect for people to love me. That's what we do so terribly well in this society. We teach people that they have to be perfect to be loved. I thought, and that, that made it all through me. I remember all the people in my congregation who would come to me with their complaints. The woman who said, no matter what I do for my widowed mother, it's never enough. I leave work twice a week early to go clean her apartment and cook supper for her, and she never says thank you. All she does is complain that I came late and I look tired. 
The man who said to me, I messed up because my father never told me he loved me. And I said, God, I believe you, but you know, that was your father's problem. You are a perfectly lovable person. Your father was emotionally constricted and couldn't get the words out. And if your father were here tonight, we could ask him, he would say, you're right, of course I love my son, but I was raised not to express my feelings in words. And if we could conjure up the spirit of your grandparents, they would say, yes, we raised him to be very close about his feelings, because we thought that's the way you're supposed to raise a man. And we could trace this all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it wouldn't change anything. You were a nice person with a father who couldn't tell you how he felt. And the man will look at me and he say, yeah, Rabbi, intellectually I know you're right. But you know something that still hurts, you never told me. This notion that people will stop loving us if we're not perfect. I found it myself. I would listen to my congregants bringing me these problems, and I realized, yes, I'm like that. Every time somebody comes to me with a problem, I expect myself to have a wonderful, brilliant answer to it. And I feel terrible if every, anybody brings me a question I can't answer. And every time I get up to give a sermon, it's going to be a knockout of a sermon. And I get so depressed if I give a mediocre sermon. I had an experience about three weeks ago. I was just starting to travel around the country promoting my new book. I was on a talk show in Chicago from 8 to 9 o'clock at night. And at 9 o'clock, I was going to go to the airport and catch a late plane to the next city. And I was tired. It was my fifth media event of the day. And I was eager to get on the plane and get there already. In the car going from the radio station to the airport, I realized I had messed up the last question. I had totally not understood what the woman was asking. And I had given her a glib, superficial answer that was no help at all. And I felt terrible about it. Then I said to myself, wait a minute. I'm traveling around the country, promoting a book that says, you know, you won't have to be perfect. <laughs> Five people called in with questions. I gave good answers to four of them, and I flew the fifth. That's really not a bad average. I can live with that. <laughs> but this is so hard for us to learn, that we can be acceptable even if we are not perfect. I have this idea that if tomorrow morning every woman in America woke up feeling good about her appearance, the American economy would collapse. <laughs> Think of all the industries that are built on the assumption women are dissatisfied with their appearance, they're afraid people will not love them unless they can make themselves look like movie stars and fashion models. From fashion, to cosmetics, to beauty parlors, uh, to diet foods, to diet magazines, to diet workshops, to plastic surgery, to liposuction, there is no end to it. All of it predicated on the assumption that if you are not perfect looking, you won't be lovable. Now the truth is, and I hope the women in the audience know this, the truth is the women who are the most pleasant to be with are not the stunning beauties. They are the women who are at peace with themselves. The women who like themselves. The women who, who are not obsessed every moment of the day with their weight and their hair and their clothes and their figure, but can stop worrying about themselves and be present to the person that they're with. Those are the women whose company you enjoy. But nobody tells you that. Everybody gives you the notion that you have to be perfectly groomed to be acceptable. We do the same thing to men, but not so much in fashion, so that we're getting there, but in terms of their earning power. That if, you know, the, the guy who earns a good living brings home his paycheck every week, pays the bills, but doesn't earn what Michael Jordan earns, we teach him to feel like a failure. Did you see that commercial in the Atlanta Olympics last summer? The one that said, you don't win the silver, you lose the gold. That's got to be the dumbest commercial I've ever seen. Can you imagine? Can you imagine saying to the second best sprinter in the world, you are a loser, because on this particular Tuesday afternoon, one person ran that race a 20th of a second faster than you? I mean, it's crazy to hold people up to the standard of perfection. But this is what we do. Some of it we get from our parents, who thought they were helping us by criticizing what we did wrong. And, you know, you bring home four A's and a B, 
And instead of saying, isn't that wonderful, have an extra piece of chocolate cake, they say, you know, if you worked a little harder, you could have gotten an A in history too. We get it from our churches and synagogues, from reading the story of Adam and Eve as a story of people who have to be perfect, from being told that any time you disappoint God, God comes down hard on you and turns you into a sinner. And we mess ourselves up that way. Children think they need perfect parents. Children, because the child's world is so overwhelming, so frightening, so out of control, children are convinced they need parents who will always be there for them, always calm, always wise, always knowing the answer, always capable of fixing the toy that breaks. Fact of the matter is, none of these kids are going to have perfect parents. And it's a good thing for them that they don't. What the best thing we can do for our children is not present them in an image of a perfect parent, an image they will never be able to live up to. And the only way we can maintain that image is by becoming very defensive, justifying ourselves, lying, and finding other people to blame. The best thing we can do for our children is give them a model of how to be a good person who is not a perfect person. Go back and read those stories in the Bible. All those Bible heroes were good people who were not perfect. Good people who were lousy parents. Good people who were bad husbands and wives. I mean, look at them. Abraham exiles one of his children and almost murders the other. Isaac favors one of his sons over the other and causes a, a brutal rivalry between them. Jacob who was rejected by his father, does the same thing, favors one of his children. They don't get along with their wives, they don't listen to them, and yet these are the people who have shaped Western civilization. They were good people, they were splendid people, they just weren't perfect people. The best thing you can do for our children is show them how you can be a good person without being perfect. I was speaking in Kansas City a couple of weeks ago, the woman who drove me from my lecture to the airport told me a wonderful story. I wish I'd heard it before I would have put it in the book. She told me how her 15-year-old daughter had come into her recently and said, Mom, can I ask you a question? I says, sure, what do you want to know? The daughter says, um, uh, did you and Daddy sleep with each other before you were married? The mother has a patient moment and says, yes, we did. Why do you ask? The girl says, oh, because Daddy said you didn't. <laughs> Sometimes they'll disappoint us by moving 
far from home after college and never seeing us. And sometimes they'll disappoint us by moving back home after college. <laughs> circumstances are, we will have scripts for our children. In our heads, we will have scripts for how we want our children to turn out. And the one thing you can count on is that your children will deviate from those scripts. And then what do you do? Can you accept them for the people they are? I have this beautiful passage in my book where I quote Mary and Bright Edelman in a little book called The Measure of Our Success. She has a letter to her sons where in essence she asks them to forgive her for the mistakes she made as a parent. Times when she said no where she should have said yes, or she said yes when she should have said no. Times when she scolded that she should have been delighted. Times when she got upset when she should have been pleased. She says, I didn't know a whole lot about parenting and I didn't know who to ask. And I tried to mold you with my image of what I thought you should be, instead of watching you emerge and grow and celebrate who you turned out to be. It's a very brave thing to be able to say that to your children and to ask their forgiveness. What should you do when your children don't turn out the way you hoped they would? What I say to parents is, you remember when your kids were one year old and they were just learning to walk? And that first day when they let go of the furniture and they take a tentative step and they fall down, you didn't scold them for being clumsy. You praised them for trying to do something new. You picked them up and assured them it would be better next time. Imagine if you could continue that attitude through all the years of their growing up. When they try to do something and they stumble, when they try to do something and it doesn't work out, instead of coming down hard on them, love them and reassure them. The primal fear of children is that their parents will stop loving them if they do something wrong. That's why against a background of reassurance that love will not be withdrawn, your children will be brave enough to try to do the things they need to do. If they're afraid, if they're afraid that they will make one mistake and you will stop loving them, the way Adam and Eve made one mistake and God stopped loving them, they will be so tense they won't be able to do anything right. I have sat in classrooms where children were so afraid of giving a wrong answer, so afraid of asking a question and being humiliated because it was a dumb question, there was no possibility of any learning going on. If we can give our children permission to try and to fail, and not be afraid they will have their love withdrawn if they do, who knows what sort of wonderful things they will accomplish. When we're dating, when we're courting, when we're trying to decide when we're going to marry, it is so tempting to persuade ourselves that the person we're involved in is perfect. Not because it's a compliment to that person, but because it's a compliment to us. Gee, I must really be attractive if somebody that perfect likes me. So our friends and our roommates and our parents try and point out that this person is not perfect, and we don't want to hear it. We need to believe this person is perfect. This is what we mean when we say love is blind. Romantic love does not permit itself to see the flaws in the other person. It needs to believe you have found the perfect mate. And then you get married, and almost immediately you find out that this person is not perfect. And what do you do with that discovery? <coughs> My wife and I were once part of a group that was discussing the best-selling book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus about the differences between men and women. Woman in the group told the story of how one day she and her husband came an hour late to her best friend's daughter's wedding shower. Embarrassingly late, because her husband refused to stop and ask directions to the restaurant. <laughs> You're familiar with this, it's a guy thing. A... There is a theory among Bible scholars that the Israelites wandered 40 years in the world. single woman in the group who said, if some guy did that to me, I would get out of the car, take a cab home, and never speak to him again. 
Now, I was tempted, but I restrained myself. I was, I was tempted to say to her, oh, really? And have you no quirks which would drive somebody crazy if they didn't love you enough to, to put up with them? That's why what I say is that the essence of a happy marriage is not romantic love and the illusion of perfection. The essence of a happy marriage is forgiveness. And let me make sure you understand what I mean by this. By forgiveness, I don't mean you find out your husband's been fooling around with the secretary, you say, it's okay, I don't mind. <laughs> forgiveness means accepting another person in all of his or her flawed humanity. It's, it's not forgiveness for something he's done. It's forgiveness for being an imperfect human being, because imperfect human beings are the only kind you will ever find. Forgiveness means saying to the person you're married to, I know you more intimately than anyone else in the world knows you. We have not only been physically naked with each other, we have been spiritually and emotionally naked with each other. I know all of your good points and all of your weaknesses, and I buy the package. And I am so grateful that you know me as well as you do, and you buy the package too. This is what it means to be married to somebody. In my book, I allude to a short story by Nathaniel Hawthorne called The Birthmark. It's a story of a man who is married to this very beautiful woman who has only one blemish, a large birthmark on one cheek. And over the course of years, he stops noticing her beauty and only sees the birthmark. And he says to her, you know, if you could have it surgically removed, you would be completely beautiful. And the wife says, I, I kind of like it. I think it is a beauty mark. And the husband says, well, it's the only thing that's wrong with you. The only thing that stands between you and complete beauty. And she says, so don't look at it. <laughs> and he says, but if you really loved me, you would get it fixed. And because it's so important to him, she agrees to undergo this surgical procedure to have it removed. And she dies after the operation. When I first read that story, I thought I understood what Hawthorne was saying. I thought the point he was making was that the husband could not love a flawed, imperfect, less than perfect wife. So he ended up lonely. He ended up with nobody. If you cannot love an imperfect person, you will be lonely, because imperfect people are the only kind you find. But the more I talk about the story, the more I tell it to groups, the more I'm going to suspect that maybe Hawthorne had another more subtle message in mind. Maybe what he was trying to say was that when the wife underwent the operation and had her blemish removed, and she became perfectly beautiful. There was no room for her in this world. This is not a world for perfect people. This is a world for flawed, imperfect, struggling people like you and me. When she became perfect, she had to be translated to some other world that could accommodate perfection. It's not this world. I want to digress for a moment on the question of forgiveness, because I think it's a real issue for a lot of people and it's very easily misunderstood. My pastoral experience and my personal experience has taught me that there are two reasons why people find it hard to forgive someone who's, who's hurt them. One reason is we tend to think forgiveness means acceptance. Forgiveness means condoning, saying it's all right, it wasn't so bad, you're an okay person. It doesn't have to mean that. Forgiveness can mean what you did was mean and rotten and selfish and you are a louse, but I am tired of seeing myself as a victim. And so I'm going to stop worrying about this. One young kicker, I gave a sermon about the need to forgive. And a woman in my congregation called me up the next day very upset with my sermon. She needed to talk to me. She said to me, 10 years ago, my husband walked out on me and the kids, ran off with a younger woman. For 10 years, I've had to work two jobs to pay the bills. For 10 years, I've had to tell the kids there's no money to go to the movies. And you want me to forgive him? I said to him, yes. I want you to forgive him. Not because what he did was acceptable. It was. It was a mean and thoughtless thing to do. And not because he's a nice person. He's probably not a nice person. I want you to forgive him because he has no right to live inside your head any more than he has the right to live inside your house. To forgive him means to take away his power to mess up your head, to make you an angry, bitter person. I said, look, for 10 years you've been angry at him and it hasn't hurt him at all. He's living in an understanding of his new life. But look what it's done to you. 
You don't want that. To forgive does not mean to approve. To forgive means to let go. The question is, are you prepared to give up the role of victim? Because the second reason we find the right to forgive is at some level it is morally satisfying to hold on to that resentment. It permits us to occupy the moral high ground, to feel very righteous. Uh, there's a man who tells the story of something that happened to him in a displaced persons camp after World War II. Another resident of the camp came up and said, could you lend me $10 for just a couple of days? I've got a package coming this weekend. I'll sell it on the black market. I'll give you your money back. No later than Sunday, I swear. He lends him $10. Sunday comes and the man says, there's a problem. The package was delayed. I expect it any day now. Don't worry, I'm good for the money, really. And this goes on for about six or seven weeks. Every couple of days, the man has another excuse. Finally, after several weeks, the man comes up and says, OK, I got it straight now. Here's your $10. And the lender says, keep it. For $10, it's not worth changing my opinion of you. <laughs> it's a wonderful story, but it's wrong. Anytime you can let go of grudge and resentment, whether you get your ten dollars back or not, it's a bargain. Because forgiveness is not a statement about the other person. Forgiveness is a statement about how you feel about yourself. Will you continue to see yourself as a victim? Will you continue to waste all that negative energy on resenting somebody when it really doesn't make any difference to him and it doesn't do you any good? That's about forgiving others. What does it mean to be forgiven? When we say, in my religious tradition and in yours, that God forgives us when we repent, I understand that to me, it's not a statement about God. It's not a statement about God's emotional state. I have no insight into that. I don't know how God feels about me. To say that God forgives means that something miraculous has happened to me, and I am cleansed of the burden of shame and guilt that I started with. I feel liberated, liberated from the notion that I will continue to do those same things again. It means I can start my new life in the future with the idea I don't have to be the same person I was last year. I can change. I can grow. I can break habits. Psychologists make a distinction between guilt and shame. Guilt, they say, is feeling bad for things you have done. Shame is feeling bad for who you are. Guilt is easy to deal with. If the problem is that you've done bad things, the solution is do good things. The message of guilt, feeling guilty, does not mean you're a bad person. I mean, this is so obvious that as soon as I say it, you'll say, of course, why didn't I think of that before? Feeling guilty does not mean you're a bad person. It means you're a good person who has done some bad things. That's why you feel guilty. If you were a bad person, you wouldn't feel guilty. You would be morally callous. Guilt is the proof that you are morally sensitive. So how do you work off the sense that you have done some things you feel guilty about? Do good things. Do good things not to balance the scales, but to let you say, sometimes I am weak and selfish, but look, sometimes I'm strong and generous. And I choose to say that that is the real me, and the other stuff is the exception. The real me is the person who does good, noble, kind things, not the mean and selfish one. Guilt is fairly easy to deal with, to work off, do good deeds. Shame is a lot harder, because shame has entered into the interior and has started to affect your perception of who you are. Guilt, deeds are external to you. What's the cure for shame? If you have a mild case of it, all you need is one person to love you. One person to say, you're fine. You're perfectly good. There's nothing wrong with you. If you've got a bad case of it, you may need more than that. I can't tell you how many people in the course of my travels have told me virtually the same words, that the most authentic religious experience they ever have is not in the church sanctuary on Sunday morning, but in the church basement on Tuesday night when they go to their 12-step program. One man said to me, I go to church, I hear judgment. I go to my therapist, I hear explanation. I go to my Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, I receive forgiveness. Not forgiveness for the people he's hurt with his alcoholism, because they're not there. Forgiveness for being a flawed human being. 
And he brings his burden of shame to the meeting. And he meets people who say, we know you. We know who you are. And we love you. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to lie to us. We know just how messed up you are. Welcome to this brotherhood of the flawed and the imperfect. And that cures his shame. I don't want to conclude without telling you my interpretation of the Garden of Eden story. Because I told you what I don't like about it. I told you about the way I don't want to understand it. Let me tell you what I think it is. Hold still, this may surprise you. I think the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is the biblical account of evolution. How our first human ancestors rose above the animal level and entered the world of knowing good and evil. Entered the world that no other animal can inhabit. And at that point, life became so incredibly complicated, there's no chance they could live it perfectly. For a person to live his whole human life without ever getting anything wrong is harder than for a baseball player to bat a thousand to get a hit every time up. Let me go back to the beginning. On the first page of the Bible, when God says, let us make man in our image, who's he talking to? What's the plural? Look at the verse just before that. The verse immediately before that, let us make man in our image. God creates the animals, fills the earth with every manner of beast and living creature. And then God says to the animals, let us make man in our image, yours and mine. Let's combine to bring forth a creature who will be part animal and part divine. A creature who sometimes will be driven by lust and by instinct, and sometimes will have the divine capacity to override instinct and say no to his animal nature. Let's create a creature who will resemble both of us. He will have an animal instinct in him, he will have the divine thrust in him, and those two will always be in tension with each other. And let's see how it turns out. As I read scripture, God created that first human being. I don't believe Eve was made out of Adam's rib. I believe that the Bible story is the same story that you find in Plato's Symposium, the same story you find in the Hindu mythology. It's the story of God creating an androgynous creature, Chinese twins, one male, one female. As the Bible itself says, male and how he created them. When God cannot find a mate for this double creature, he causes it to fall asleep, slices it in half. The word which 400 years ago the King James translators rendered as rib, the Hebrew word tzela, sometimes means rib, but four times more often in the Bible it means side. God took one of the sides of this creature away from the other. And when they woke up, there is a male half, and there is a female half. And that's why the story goes on to say, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they will become one flesh. That is, when a man and a woman mate with each other, something happens which does not happen in the animal world. They're not only reproducing the species, they're not only responding to the thrust of the DNA, they are re-establishing a unity which existed at the beginning of time. They are creating a new being. They're not two people sleeping together. They are one person fused out of two halves, a male side and a female side. This dual creature, this man and woman, eating the tree, of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, suddenly are thrust into a world where they understand that some things are good and some things are bad and life becomes very difficult for them. I would ask you to go back when you have a chance, reread that story without any presuppositions as to what it's about. Notice the Bible never calls it a sin. Never calls what happened in the garden of Eden a sin. Notice the Bible never said God gets angry at them. Adam and Eve think God is angry at them because they feel they've done something wrong. But the Bible never says God gets angry. And notice what God says to them, which we have been brainwashed to see as punishments. God says to Adam, from now on, because you live in the world of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to have to work for a living. 
No more going out and finding your food out there, going animals in. You're going to have to work. Is work a curse? Is it? What about all those tens of thousands of people who are out of work and who wish they had jobs? What about the lottery winner who shows up at 9 o'clock on Monday morning for his next uh, day's work? Because work is the way we define ourselves. Work is the way we make a difference to the world. Work is the way we feel necessary. There's a man in my congregation who once said to me, I never take a vacation for two reasons. First, I'm afraid the office couldn't function without me. Second, I'm afraid it could. <laughs> Adam's so-called curse that we have to work, Eve's so-called curse, bearing children in pain, I don't think these are curses. These are the blessings that God has given us to make up for our mortality. Because we're not going to live forever, and because we know we're not going to live forever, God has given us children and work to leave something of ourselves behind. When he says to Eve, childbirth will be more painful for you than it is for any other creature. When he says to her, sexuality will be more complicated for you than it is for any other living being. Yes, it makes life very difficult. It drives people absolutely frazzled. But hey, would you really want to live in a world without it? Would you want to reproduce the way animals do? Without love, without passion, without intimacy? Anonymously, not even knowing who your partner was? No, I think, given the choices, we understand that not everything that's painful is bad. I don't think it's a curse to bear children in pain. Why do so many women undergo all sorts of tests, spend tens of thousands of dollars for fertility treatments in order to have the indescribably painful experience of giving birth to a child? Because we are human. Because we have tasted the fruit of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. We know that some things are good and some things are bad. And we have this desperate yearning to leave something of ourselves behind. In the final analysis, how good do we have to be? I don't think we have to be perfect. I don't think God expects us to be perfect. I think God knows it is unrealistic to expect us to be perfect. There is a verse in the book of Genesis several chapters later where God says to Abraham, walk before me and be, the Hebrew word is tamim. And once again, King James translators have let us down. They, they translate it, work walk before me and be perfect. I don't think that's what it means. Tami means whole. Now you can understand whole to mean perfect, flawless, but you can understand whole in another sense. I think what God is saying to Abraham is, come before me in your entirety. All of you. Your good qualities and your bad qualities. I see God saying to Abraham, listen, this is not a first date where you're trying to impress me. And you're only letting your good qualities show. I know you too well. Don't fool me. Don't lie to me. Don't pretend. Don't hide your less admirable qualities. We are not going to be able to have a relationship if you hide half of yourself from me. If you deny to me who you really are. Just as a husband and wife cannot have an honest marriage if one of them is denying part of his reality, God says to Abraham, you and I cannot have an honest relationship unless you come before me in your wholeness, in your integrity, with all of your good qualities and all of your bad qualities. And don't be afraid to. Don't be afraid that when you admit your bad qualities, I will find you unacceptable. I will welcome you. I know who you are and you are welcome in my sight. How good do we have to be? We don't have to be perfect. Life is not a spelling bee where one mistake invalidates all the words you've gotten right. Life is the struggle to be a good person. God doesn't expect perfection from us. God expects an honest effort from us. God expects us to come before him in our wholeness, our whole selves. And I will tell you something. If that's good enough for God, it should be good enough for you and me as well. Thank you very much. Now that was an excellent speech, but don't go away. Uh, the Rabbi Kushner will be uh, answering some very interesting questions from the audience in just a few minutes. 
But before he does that, if this is a type of program that you enjoy and you'd like to see more of this, if you have any questions, comments, please write to Inside Longmont, P.O. Box 1342, Longmont, Colorado, 80502. We'd greatly like to hear the type of shows you'd like to see in the future. Now back to Rabbi Kushner. While there's this pregnant pause waiting for someone to break the ice, let me tell you a story about asking questions. Some years ago, I was invited to teach a course at Clark University, Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, they were just starting their Jewish Studies Department. They couldn't afford full-time faculty. So those of us who have the right number of degrees were invited to teach one course each. And every Tuesday and Thursday morning, I would drive from my home in Native to the Clark campus. I would give my talk at, from 11 o'clock on. I'd give my lecture and I'd stop for questions. And every Tuesday and Thursday, the same thing happened. There was a young man who sat in the front row who would raise his hand and say, will this be on the final? <laughs> I'm not in a position to know what will be on the final. But if there's something you want to ask, something you want to clarify or respond to or object to, this is your chance. In fact, this is your last chance of catching a morning plane back to Boston tomorrow. Uh, I hope I will get back to this area before too long because it's a wonderful area. But if you want to ask me something, you better ask me now. And he said to 
me, what good has it done me to go to synagogue every Saturday my whole life if it's not going to help me get out of this? I, I have to bite my tongue to keep from saying, well, it could have taught you not to cheat in business. <laughs> But what I said to him and what I said to many worthy of people was, the purpose of being religious is not to protect you against misfortune. Bad things happen to good people and bad people alike. I, uh, uh, at my talk at the hospice yesterday, I quoted a seminary professor of mine who used to say, expecting the world to treat you fairly because you're a decent person is like expecting the bull not to attack you because you're a vegetarian. <laughs> The purpose of religion is not to protect us against misfortune. Uh, we should have noticed sometime in the last several thousand years it doesn't work. The purpose of religion is that when our share of misfortune strikes us, we are capable of surviving it. The purpose of religion, the purpose of faith, is to make us resilient enough that misfortune does not sour us on life and on the world. To give us the strength, to give us the source of strength, that we need when misfortune comes. The response, the authentic religious response, the mature religious response, when we are struck with misfortune, when bad things happen to us that we don't deserve, is not to say, God, why didn't you take better care of me? It's to say, God, help me get through this because I'm not sure I can get through it without you. That's where religious faith is necessary for the person who's struck by misfortune. <clears throat> Long spent, I asked you, who is the Christ? Uh, the, uh, the one asked me, who is the Christ? Uh, I'm not sure I know. I think he is different people. He is someone different for different people. I think you probably realize that as a rabbi and as a Jew, I don't affirm Jesus as the Messiah. I see Jesus as God's instrument for bringing the knowledge of God and the morality of the Hebrew Bible to the entire world. I think Jesus was an instrument used by God so that people who were not Israelites would come to know God, to love God, and to know what God demands of them. Uh, and for that, I feel a very special kinship with all who recognize God because Jesus has brought them to die. Thank you.
The only thing I can say to them would be the closing words of my address tonight. If who you are is good enough for God's to love, who do you think you are to hold yourself to higher standards than God does? Now, forgive yourself. If you're, um, if you're not a real mouse, forgive yourself. <laughs> forgive yourself because that is the necessary prerequisite for growing and changing. Only the person who says, I am really okay, is able to change. The person who says, I am hopeless, I keep on doing this, I always mess up, that person's not going to change. Every time that person finds himself or herself in that same situation, that person will go back to the old ways of responding. Only the person who says, I am better than that, that's not the real me. Only that person is going to know how to, how to do it better the next time he finds himself in a situation. Would you speak to the power of prayer and your feelings about that? The power of prayer. Power of prayer. Uh, yes, I, yeah, I was invited to address the Jewish community of Boulder this morning. We got into that a little bit. Uh, I suggested that one of the things that's happened in Western society is that we have confused God with Santa Claus. And we have learned to think of prayer as making a list of everything you want and don't have and persuading God that you've been a good girl or boy and you deserve it. No, I'm sorry, that's not prayer, that's Santa Claus. Prayer is not so much asking as thanking. I believe the first building block of a religious view of life is gratitude. Prayer is coming into the company of God, coming into the presence of God and being changed by that encounter. In terms of what we've been talking about, the quest of perfection, let me share with you two prayers from the Bible uttered by the same man in the same place 20 years apart. The man is the patriarch Jacob. The first time we encounter Jacob in prayer, he's a teenager who's run away from home. He's got into trouble at home. He lied to his father. He stole the birthright from his older brother. You remember the story. And he's really messed, up, messed himself up at home. He's running away to his uncle Laban's house in another country. First night away from home, it's getting dark. Jacob is scared. He's a frightened adolescent. He prays and listens to this teenager's prayer. Jacob says, God, get me through this. Bring me home okay, and I will worship you exclusively and kick back 10% of everything I ever heard. <laughs> That's his prayer. Everything I make, I will tithe to you. 10% kickback. Jacob is bargaining with God. You expect him to say, that's not enough, 15%. <laughs> 20 years later, Jacob comes to that same river bank, which is the border between Canaan and Aram, coming from the other direction. He's older and wiser. He's been married, he's had children, he's made a fortune, he's lost a fortune. Now he's coming home after 20 years. Tomorrow morning, he's going to meet his brother Esau for the first time in 20 years. The last time he saw his brother, his brother said, the next time I see you, I'm going to kill you. And this is it. And Jacob again is scared. And again, a frightened Jacob prays. But now, listen to his prayer. No bargains, no kickbacks, no discussions, no negotiations with God. Listen to the prayer of a more mature Jacob. Now he says, God, you've got to help me. Not because I can do anything for you. I have no way of thanking you for what you've already given me. You don't owe me anything more. You've got to help me very simply because I can't do this without you. In essence, I understand Jacob's prayer was saying, for my whole life to this point, every time I've been in a crisis situation, I have responded by lying and running away. I am tired of lying and running away. That's not the kind of person I want to be. But I'm sure if I have to face Esau tomorrow, I'm going to fall back into the same patterns again. I can't do this by myself. God, help me become a better person. And I think I can do what I know is right. That's a prayer. That's a prayer for forgiveness. That's a prayer for change. No bargains, no kickbacks, no kind of thing. Just saying, God, you've got to help me because I know this is right. I can't do it without you. That's a prayer I can believe in. Yes, you were uh, 
I'm going to ask the last question. You just answered it. Oh, great. <laughs> In that case, all that's left is for me to thank Don Oslaw and the committee and the pastor and all of you for coming tonight so that our gathering could be so successful. I come away reaffirmed and strengthened by our encounter. And I hope that you go to your homes reaffirmed and strengthened as well. So thank you and bless you all.